Good afternoon and welcome to this, the second in our series of Consumer Health Forum websites, uh, web webinar series on the My Health Record. Today, our panel with contributions and questions from you, the online participants, will explore the My Health Record from the perspective of an overview. My name is Mark Metherill and I'm Communications Director of the Consumers Health Forum. We're fortunate today to have on our panel a group of individuals with great experience and knowledge about the issues that we will be discussing today. I first of all introduce Dr Christine Slade, who's a lecturer in higher education, higher education at the Institute of Teaching and Learning Innovation at the University of Queensland, where her research includes digital health curriculum. Since 2004, Christine has undertaken her professional career while living with chronic illness. She is an active user of the My Health Record and has experienced firsthand through the Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane the significant difference digital health can make to a consumer's life. Christine is currently a member of the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare's My Health Record in Emergency Departments Oversight Committee. Next, Professor Ian Hickey, who has for many years been a leading national advocate for better services and policy for those living with mental health issues. Ian is co-director of the Brain and Mind Centre of the University of Sydney. He is an NH and MRC Senior Principal Research Fellow and until recently he was a Commissioner on the National Mental Health Commission which he had uh, been with since its, point, since its establishment in 2012. Um, he is internationally renowned uh, as a researcher in various branches of clinical psychiatry and importantly uh, for us here has a deep interest in the development of the My Health Record. And also we're fortunate to have Garth MacDonald who is General Manager Service Delivery at the Australian Digital Health Agency which administers the My Health Record. Garth has an extensive public sector management experience before starting his journey with digital health more than 10 years ago with Medicare. Uh, he's helped deliver its health identifier system and he has since held senior positions in data operations and strategy with the Department of Human Services. In his current position, Garth and his team are driving the future agenda of digital health to support a healthier Australia. And of course we have you, our online participants, to offer your questions and perspective. I will deal with as many questions posed by you before and during this session as time permits. The webinar series has been designed and directed by the Consumer Health Forum and has been made possible with funding support from the Australian Digital Health Agency. Thinking about my health record in terms of an overview is to open the door into a fairly vast world of current and potential developments of digital health, including not just the widening scope for storage and communications of health records between patients and doctors, but also the way in which therapeutic and diagnostic technology is deployed to, to improve health outcomes. So to kick off, I'd like to ask each of our panellists to give a, a brief overview of how they see the My Health Record and the implications. We'll just keep this opening bit as brief as we can, but I'd first of all like to ask Garth, how do you see the My Health Record and what it will mean to all of us? Look, I really see the My Health Record as an opportunity to, um, I guess, improve the health of all Australians. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons I work at the Digital Health Agency. Really, the ability to share information securely and safely throughout Australia between clinicians, um, practices, hospitals and so forth just gives us that opportunity to improve people's lives but also improve the, the quality of data and how we um, manage that throughout the Australian health ecosystem. Thank you. And Christine? I think that my health record gives consumers an opportunity to be more participatory in their uh, health um, outcomes and that particularly for people like myself who have chronic illness it's uh, or, or complex conditions it enables them to have more understanding of different health avenues and be able to um, 
I think, decide for themselves how much they actually want to be active in their own health care and uh, decision making and self-management perhaps. So it's opening a lot of um, opportunities for people to be more actively involved. Thank you, Christine. Ian, what's your view? It's essential. If we're going to see any significant progress in health outcomes and the quality of healthcare delivery in Australia, we need this back-end bit, health records, to be open, particularly to what Christine was saying. And where it needs to go is greater involvement of people themselves to be empowered to manage their own healthcare. This is the essential back-end bit before we get on with the real bit, which is how do you actually come to control your own health? So first of all, we ask a question. Many people will be saying, well, what is the difference between health and digital health? What's your view on that? What would you say, Garth? Look, I think, um, really, to me, it's just health. Um, the only reason we probably differentiate between health and digital health at the moment is there is legacy practices of paper files and faxes and so forth that you would probably deem to be more in an old old school type health environment. But the reality is every interaction now will have some digital part, whether it's your x-rays being sent electronically through to your doctor and retrieved online, whether it's using telehealth and communicating across fast things. They're all digital health. And it's going to evolve into, you know, virtual reality to treat mental health issues or whatever mm. that may be. So I think you'll find in 10 years, five years, it'll just be health. I think it'll really move from having a distinction um, that we probably have today. You've been a big user already of it. What's your view? Do you think it'll be... we won't distinguish in five years' time? I would say that's true. I think uh, digital systems will be just come mainstream and probably the word digital re will be dropped off. I think the benefit or uh, the difference between health and digital health in my mind is that if it's digital, it's online, but it integrates lots of different systems that we haven't been able to do on paper. And therefore, because it's doing that, it's opening new opportunities across the individual consumer, but also cohorts of consumers and also the health system and clinicians to be able to do a lot more things because of the flexibility and the richness of the data that they're collecting. Yes, yes indeed. And integration, what's your sense of this, Ian? Integration, it's the empowerment bit. I think what's really different, I had to sit in a doctor's surgery yesterday myself with the silly magazines left over from 15 years ago, no <laughs> access to the records, not able to leave and go to the next doctor with the appropriate <laughs> sets of yes. records. In the future, you'll sit there, you'll be in control of what happens, you'll take the data with you so that healthcare is actually organised around you not around the provider. So health has been a provider-centric, we have the records, we do what needs to be done. In the future, it will be exactly the opposite. Yeah. And I think that's the really empowering, interesting bit. We aren't there yet. There are many sets of issues around privacy, confidentiality, the transfer. But at the end of the day, can you imagine? And we, we can imagine. We all do it with our banking now, with our other things now, with travel now, everything else. Health is back there in the mid-20th century. Everybody else is in the 21st century where you control your own journey through all those other systems. And we in health need to get there quickly to have better outcomes, particularly if you've got chronic and complex illness. No. You know, at the moment, you're in a bad situation. You don't know. When you've got it with you and it goes everywhere, we as providers will be much better at organising care around your needs. Christine, you've been the one with the on-the-spot on the experience, if you like, using my health record with your condition. Would you agree with Ian? Is this the way you see it? Or? I would. I think that... At this stage, it's still very um, rudimentary, in my opinion. Um, it's really a repository of information. I'm anticipating that that will grow into a more, um, more like a portal idea where I can have interaction or I, there's more interaction between care people, but I, I appreciate that we're in early stages of that. I think the, the perhaps dilemma might be for consumers is that they may not understand necessarily digital things very well. So we need to be able to help them understand, would this be a benefit for me and how could it be a benefit? And some consumers may not want to actually pick up everything that is in there. Other consumers like myself are very highly motivated and do want this partnership and this empowerment. So I guess it's around choice for the consumers, they, but they need to understand what they're making the choice on. Mm. This all sounds ideal, Garth, but is it practical or possible with a national, highly technological regulated system like we have in health? Look, I think the aim is to, to basically be an enabler. So, you know, if you look at, look at the National Digital Health Strategy, 
It's actually a, um, you know, a paper that's come together across state and territory governments and, and the Commonwealth to actually look at the future for health. Now, what we're looking at is how do we provide the enablers so all these things that people are suggesting can occur. And for me, it's around how do I make that core bit of information safe and secure? Mm -hmm. So while the banking ideas and all that, we all want to embrace them and jump out, I think the public has to come on that journey of just because they put everything on Facebook may not mean they want the same with their health record. And so how do we get it that you have a choice of what is shown and shared is managed in a way that you feel safe and secure so you build that trust and then hopefully we can get to that more innovative where you know we have phones and devices and watches and other things that can share but in a way that people are managing that record as themselves. It's their core data that they can choose how it's, how it's shared. Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, what would each of you, I mean, a lot of people say, well, health data, what does it mean to me? Um, because of this idea we're moving from paper-based records that the doctor has kept to data, which can mean all sorts of things. In one sentence, what would each of you, how would you describe health data? Currently, 19th century, <laughs> hopeless. <laughs> I'm trying to take care of someone with a complex manic depressive bipolar illness. There's a bit in a hospital, patient I was taking care of yesterday. She's got immune data in one hospital. She's got medication data in another hospital. She doesn't know herself what all the answers to all those questions are. Some of it's unreported, untravelling. I'm supposed to be making decisions about medications and prescriptions now mm. using a 19th century system. It's like paper tickets travelling on airlines we used to have. Have you got yes. the ticket? Yes. It's your responsibility. And when people are unwell, to assume that they are managing that situation or even understand what happened mm -hmm. at the last hospital they were at or the last doctor they were at. And Australia's very complicated. Our health system's very hybrid. There are hundreds, thousands of providers, each holding different bits. I mean, to me, the My Health Record, it's the national highway system. It's the connecting system. Could you imagine we all travelled on one-lane roads around the country trying to get a service at the other end? I mean, I don't think people realise how much their health is put at risk by the current system. But as a provider, I'm aware every day of the week mm. I have to postpone decisions through a lack of information in real time to the person's real needs. And the moment you travel across systems, it barely works if you're in one of our hospitals alone, yeah. <laughs> let alone if you're in a hospital, out of a hospital, you've got a specialist, a GP, mm -hmm. other care, a pharmacist to organise. So I think, Mark, people just, in a lot of the discussion recently, are just really not aware. A lot of the discussions being by people who are not really in the health system and not really facing the issues. Me, as a prescriber, as a doctor, I am barely able to function effectively in complex disease areas on our current data systems. Right. Mm. That was a long. That was a long <laughs> one sentence for data. What's your? What's your? I'd, I'd just add to that as a patient in a hospital that had paper, and going across many. Um, different departments, I was always pleased to see the file arrive. <laughs> and I didn't realise, you know, at one point that it didn't have a summary page and that I was actually now the source of truth for my own care, which frightened <laughs> me quite a lot. Yeah. Um, I think also on another aspect of data, some consumers can be a bit frightened by that term because they think that that's going to invade their privacy and it could be used for things that they don't have control over. So I guess data means different things to different people. To me, data would be what is recorded about me that I can access and have as a, you know, a tool to help me mm. be a partner in my care. And I realise that clinicians and others are looking forward to having bigger systems of data because that till now they haven't actually been able to know so many things because they're siloed paper or whatever. So it's exciting in that way, but I guess it needs to uh, assure co consumers that it's safe for them to use this type mm. of online mm. data. What about you? What's your perspective on this? Look, I, I see it as an opportunity. So from a consumer, probably to put it simply, it's an opportunity to have a better and clearer involvement in managing their own health. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, how do you see the long-term vision for digital health and is there much we can learn from overseas and how does Australian digital health uh, arrangement so far compare with best overseas practice? Can you tell us? So look, I think to answer the first part, um, the long-term view for digital health, and particularly for the My Health Record, is to, to continue to involve, to be that highway, to be that facilitator of, of information. Um, as we've gone a few times, we've talked around, you know, there's going to be a public conversation on the way and how that works. But if you look at how it works internationally, like, for example, Israel has a national 
a health record right now. What they don't have is any access to it by consumers. So therefore, they have a record that is put in place by the government, allows the information to be shared across the providers. They get all the benefits of the medicines and the data being exchanged freely. What they don't have, which we have in Australia, is the ability to go in and access your own data, control which bit of data is shared. So you can opt out of my health record, you can put a restriction on the record, so you have to provide codes to access it, you can remove documents you not, don't feel you want to share. Mm. Mm. That level of um, control and access is pretty much unique in the world in terms of these sort of health records. OK, OK. What's your... Have you looked at all assist overseas developments um, here, Christine? Only a, a bit. I think <coughs> more probably in the hospital system because I'm more connected with the Queensland Public Hospital System and their digital rollouts. I, I think one of the things I see here is the interoperability with the hospitals and the trying to connect even with the emergency departments across all of the hospitals that uh, we're working hard to try and make this connection because that's one of the keys. If we can't use the My Health record with other systems, then it's mm. going to be very limited. So I think we're doing quite well at some of the rollouts in the hospitals and, and being able to, um, compared to other countries in the world where no. perhaps some bits have been missing on some of their systems, we seem to be trying to tackle that mm. um, quite well. Right. Ian, is there much we can learn from overseas in your experience? Yes. Not only that, overseas is going to solve the problem. I mean, internationally. At the moment, every health system in the world is constrained by health. Like, like health is so controlling, it's so starving right? And we think we're acting in behalf of people. In fact, you don't own your own health record at all. It's owned by the organisations that have collected it. You don't have access now to that information. People say things, they collect things, they're accurate, they're inaccurate, they're out of date. So what's happening here is actually the big innovations are not in health. They're actually in Apple, Google, Amazon, elsewhere, and they're personally controlled. So the model is, in fact, that you control, and this is what was alluded to, where we're actually going. You decide how that record works. And until health gets it in its head that the consumer has to be at the centre of it, and help, most health organisations still don't. Most hospitals, most other institutions, most professional organisations still think it's about them and information they trade about you with somebody else. All the people that come from the personal technology information industry see it the other way around. Mm. You put consumers in charge of their own world, guess what? Health changes and it'll change like finance, it'll change like airlines, it'll change like everything else we do because it has to work at the consumer end. Mm. And in, the, in this case, to improve your health. I mean, this is about trust. Do you trust your bank or not? Do you think your bank gives your information away every day or not? In your own health, your own data is precious to your own care. I would say your health is in danger now through the current system. If you get sick, for God's sake, you want the data not to have to report it yourself as you go from operating theatre to recovery. You want the data to be available to clinicians now in real time. You really only said, I think, in intensive cares now is about the only place the data is really at the bedside in real time. That should be there all the time. So the innovations are coming, mm. but I wouldn't be looking in health. They're actually happening internationally through consumer-controlled device and systems. The issue is, do we have a highway to connect to when they arrive? Do we have a highway to connect to when we arrive? We, we do, and that's what we are continuing to improve. Um, the My Health record has, you know, been in place for six years, has worked extremely well. The opportunity of having the national... having all the public connected, or, or those who don't opt out, really gets us to become embedded into the actual workflow and processes with hospitals and practices and so forth, so that it actually becomes mainstream activity. And I think that will then give the opportunity that well, if I connect this information, it'll be shared readily, whereas at the moment you connect it to one hospital, but is it mm. being used by your practice or your, you know, um, you know, specialists that you attend and so and forth? And can I say, if we don't do that, we'll be left out. People won't bring those innovations here if there's mm. no highways, like the yeah. aeroplanes. If there's yeah. no, nowhere to land, why go there? <laughs> you yeah. know, one of the things is we've got to have a national system for all these other innovations to arrive and connect to. So, you know, some of the stuff that's going on at the moment, oh, we may, maybe we shouldn't do this, we'll need another five years... This is happening internationally. The question is which countries are up to connecting their health systems to the innovations in, innovation te in information technologies. And so I think the really good aspect of this and the opt-out aspect is get organised now for the revolution that is coming in consumer-controlled healthcare. What do you think, Christine? I mean, isn't there a tension here? We say we're giving, empowering the patient, but we're a lot of people seeing the amount of data that the system can collect and be held by providers or whatever, 
will be uh, nervous about this, do you think, or not? I think that's true. I think that a lot of people would be excited, but because sometimes innovation can be threatening, mm. Because uh, we may not be able to keep up with it. For example, cyber security now is the big hot topic where, you know, we have seen breaches of different important systems and so that can cause some people to go, I don't want to do that. Well, that's okay, but I think that shouldn't be the barrier that stops us moving forward with, in, you know, innovation, integration, uh, making sure, I think one of the key things is making sure that systems do talk to each other. So if we have the My Health record, then we need to work hard at not sprouting other little systems in other places um, for convenience. We need to be able to have those conversations to say we need to all connect. Otherwise it falls down because we can't, the consumer can't, you know, Can travel I from one place to the other. Um, so so that's, that is quite a big issue, I see. Uh, uh, I mean, as far as integrated care, for instance, that... We are in um, in the health or groups like the Consumers Health Forum is wanting more in the way of integrated, coordinated primary health care, and that would one presumes be helped by an integrated information system. So different uh, specialists and allied health professionals and the like can see that patient's data all at the same yes. time. I was just going to that... say that's different to banking and that because banks have their own systems. In health, we're actually asking more. We're asking for the whole lot of the things in health to be connected as much as possible so we can see across different services. And, and I think that's quite a massive task because, um, you know, I know in every state things are different and done differently, different systems. One of the big ones is, and you may be able to answer some more, Garth, is that a lot of the systems, in IT systems, hospitals have, for example, don't talk to each other. And but then across states, states, even within hospitals. Talk, well, yes, and so when you ask it to all sort of line up, it's what you might think is a very small thing to achieve. It is yeah. actually a big thing. But this is the... I mean, when you say banks just talk to themselves, they don't. They talk to retail, they talk to your credit card, they transfer money. So we have systems, Reserve Bank and others sit across this. I mean, we're finally on the road to having a governance system mm -hmm. and those... what the National Digital Agency is doing, talking all those things, so that eventually and hopefully not too far in the future, it becomes as efficient as you flacking, taking yeah. a credit card and tapping it or transferring it and that going to your bank account. There are many other people who see that data. I was thinking more happen. across the banks themselves aren't talking to each other necessarily. Well, they do, they trade. They're competitors, yeah. But they trade, so they're both competitive, but they also mm. have to trade information. So there are regulatory frameworks in many other areas that have dealt with mm. highly secure data, as you would expect my bank account not to be yes. hacked by somebody else. So I think in health we're just really... We're very protective, we're very careful for good reasons, yes. and there are very good reasons, and you always have the option of opting out. You know, if you really don't want anyone to see anything, much, if you don't want to have a credit card, you don't want to have a bank account, you know, but really, as you, if you've got a chronic health problem, do you realise the risk you're actually currently at by the non-sharing of information yeah. that's critical to decision making? I think that's very true. I don't think consumers do really no. understand one, what it's like for clinicians to actually have to address things. For example, if I want results of some test and they're not on site, what they have to go through to actually get those to then deliver to me. So there's a lot of work involved. Um, the fact they can't necessarily see everything. And, you know, as I said, the paper file and, you know, I'm the source of truth about medications or whatever. Yes, <laughs> that was actually a real eye-opener to me when I discovered that. And it was quite... No, it, it, I didn't realise before that, that the system was the that fragile. So you're taking the blue one or the red one. You know, it's not a really good system. Yeah, what name is that? Garth, could I ask you, somebody mentioned tapping. Could we get to a state in the, with the, my health record where we can tap, tap our card when we go to see the doctor or whoever, and that's going to immediately tell the doctor the latest state of play in terms of our, you know, medical history? Look, it's been used in some countries. So Germany actually has a model where they have a smart card that they allow you to actually do tap and that sort of thing. Um, it's really... It, what's the advantage of that? So, so is carrying information more secure than having it in a record? Do you have that as access or security to get into your system? So those things are possible, but it's actually really asking the question is what is the outcome you're trying to achieve, yeah. which is really having the right information in front of the doctor yeah. at the time of service. And so whether that's through having the card that brings it in, whether it's us having it in the My Health Record system so people can pull it down, mm. or even through our work on interoperability and so forth, just having 
the, I guess, like train lines of disconnect that you know we might have between hospitals and practices line up so that the data comes across is recognisable in all those systems. There's a whole bunch of ways, I think, to get there. Yeah. So I don't know if the card... Yes, if you wanted to, you could do yeah. that. Banking has shown you can do tap and go, but does that get the outcome we want? I think the outcome is getting the right data um, securely in front of in front of the clinician at the time yeah. he needs yeah. it or but she but needs it. I don't think, I mean, the data, this is a bit of a problem, I think, in, in the dialogue. It's always about the clinician. It's actually not whether the clinician can see the data. It's also whether you can check whether it's accurate. Sure. You know, whether, so the active participation here, you know, about whether the data is accurate and is relevant to the particular thing. So I think where we haven't got yet, what people are not seeing yet, is where records can go where the consumer, the patient, is actually much more active in that particular process and how they can see then decision-making happening <laughs> in which they are a partner to things. Mm. So I think one of the problems we had in Australia, it's largely been a discussion behind closed doors, behind providers, trust us, it's good for you. Yep. And people are going, hang on a second, I can't see this. How's this good for me? Yeah. <laughs> Unless you've been in the situation And I think that's the, the advantage of, of having this, you know, the My Health Record and having it so citizen centric and you being able to look at it yourself is to add that value. And I suppose that's... You that's... still can't interact with it yourself. There's a way to go here with tools. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, look, at the moment, what is uploaded to the My Health Record is what you can see. Yeah. And I guess there is that broader ecosystem of stuff that isn't. And I mean, we've got to have that um, discussion of is that something that will come into the record in the future or not? As you said, hospitals make collect information and then they may not see that relevant to a summary document that's shared. Um, and that's probably a, you know, that's a separate conversation really to the My Health Record function is where does the broader e-health go in terms of, you know, state-based or nationally-based EMRs and hospitals and how private and public work and interact between each other, which is uh, probably as, broader. As part of that, we've had a question from one of our uh, viewers. Tanya asked, does this mean clinicians have to update the certain records as requested by patients? Now, I'm guessing she's saying... Is she the, the extent to which um, clinicians must follow the patient's request for updating? What's your... And clinicians funny people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends how you see partnerships in care. I love those kind of questions, you know. Might have to do something that the patient wants. <laughs> <laughs> or this idea they'll change the record or whatever else. I mean, we have an issue about what's actually going into the records now. In some sense, the sort of privacy, I may have written something about you and I don't want to, you know, whatever else, yes. yeah. may contain material that clinicians consider should be kept confidential. I'd say what exactly mm. are you putting in those records that you are not sharing with the person? And you, if you want to record the person's perspective about that particular thing, you can do that in particular ways. There are issues about, at the moment, what is directly shared. So I think what you have and what we find a lot of work we're in, a lot of the resistance is actually at the clinician level through a misunderstanding of these issues. Mm. You, you made a comment about people not understanding digital health. I'd suggest people understand digital consumer things very strongly. My 91-year-old yes. mum banks by, you know, by personal you? computer. You know, actually... We expect a very high level of consumer interaction. Clinicians are kind of going, I'm not really used to this. I used to write records mm. for me. Yes. <laughs> Am I really working with you <laughs> but, uh, on this shared health plan? So it's a different kind of record in the future if you have a partnership in care. This person seems to be raising the question that maybe the clinician may not record everything the patient wants, uh, even where it may be you know, wanted, to what extent can the patient say, no, I want you to put that down? Well, I can say something to that. I think, well, obviously, you know, you get GP summaries in that as well, so I have seen that coming through. At the moment, I mean, I think one limitation of the My Health record is that I could write myself notes as the patient, but nobody else gets to see them. And I think that's, that's one thing I would really like to see change. Now, I, I know there's an argument to say, I might not get it right, but I have a subjective, you know, lived experience of my illness, which I could be quite an expert at over time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the health system is objective and it writes, fair enough, but I think we should be able to write this, uh, the lived experience in there as, as long as we're sort of on the same page of partnership to be mm. effective about, you know, our health. And people should be able to see that. Yeah. I mean, the clinician great? should be it's... able to see what I'm writing. Isn't that great? That's new, right? This whole electronic record is about the providers, 
Now you can have healthcare, we can put your actual experience in. Or even more importantly, we're working with families, like a parent of a child can put accurate information in, or mm. the child of a parent with dementia can put accurate mm. information in, so that that very important carer information, subjective yes. information, actually becomes part of the record. That's right. Not in competition with the clinician, but in addition yeah. to the clinician, because it often has critical information which is never recorded or recorded inaccurately in the current records. Garth, can, is that right? You, the patient can put something in, but it will not be seen by other clinicians? Or? So people do, we, we do have some um, people like we have a My Health Record Improvement Group and one of our <coughs> patient advocates um, who's on that actually uses that quite actively to record information and he then shares that with his clinician. Now, it's not sh like naturally that it goes through and becomes a document in the system that is sent around between the doctors, but I guess it's a way of, you know, if people work well with their doctor and they have built that relationship trust, yeah. even now you would possibly turn up with, whether it's paper-based or on a USB, or here's all the information I've collected around, I took my own heart rate or I did XYZ or here's my exercise. So this gives you a way of capturing that electronically. But I suppose that's that, um, you know, we're hopefully empowering the the consumer or the mm, patient mm. to actually be able to have that conversation with their doctor, to sort of go, I want to contribute more to my health, how do I get you that information? And then it's really up to the, the two of them to work on what, what is the best approach. Well, can I just put other critical information? The area I work in in mental health, I can say in advance, I want you to involve my wife in this when I'm unwell. Yep. And to put that in there and yeah. to be known in a particular, in the forward ways and to, be, and to be used in real time in a particular critical situation and when things happen, express views mm. about particular that should influence the decision making, but they won't necessarily be known by all the people along that path. Yeah, yeah. And they need to be known at critical and often at acute points mm. or at serious points along the way. And that's the kind of thing that's been missing from our records. So I think this really much more empowered person in care, in partnership, starts to become possible. Now, uh, but do presumably a lot of um, GPs would already record that sort of information. I want my partner to be in on the decision-making or whatever, they would already do that, wouldn't they? But if you turn up at the local hospital acutely and it's in the GP's thing... Okay. I've recently acute hospital asked the doctor to ring me to ring the GP to ask them what they had in their record that was sent by the hospital. I went, oh. what? <laughs> <laughs> because they had no access to that. But it was a, often in a hospital, in an emergency department, in another setting, that acute thing, something really important, might well have been in the GP oh. record, but it's not shared with the hospital. It's not there at the point of care where a critical decision is actually being made. And I think some of these personal preference things, consumer preference things, are really important. Mm. And some bits of information, um, they might be life-saving. Others may be, you know, I've previously had bad experience with opiates, for example, and whatever, and I really prefer that you did not give me opiates for my mm. pain relief. And, you know, so yeah. there can be various levels, I think, of information which can improve the journey of care and the experience of care if they're available at critical decision-making points along that journey. What about mental health care? That's your specialty. Yep. What can you tell us about the impact and influence of the My Health Record in that sphere? Well, there are divided opinions. This will surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of those areas, not the other areas, in sexual health and other areas, where people coming in for the first time are often worried that some information will go into a record. They might have shared confidentially previously with a GP or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but they wouldn't want it to be widely available. So often new ent people entering new for care are a bit worried about the confidentiality and the privacy. At the other end, those with complex problems, and many of the mental health advocates in this area, consumer advocates, say, mm. for God's sake, would you get all the information there? Because I have complex mental health, physical mm. health. We previously had different parts of the hospital where the records were locked up differently and kept separate. The person with a mental health problem turns up at the emergency department, couldn't access the records, couldn't access the medications. So the more complex and ongoing illness, like other areas of chronic illness, the patients in that area and their families are saying, for God's sake, would you get on with this so I can get effective care at the right point. So there's a bit of a division, I think, here about the trade-off between confidentiality and concerns about privacy, because people don't want all yeah, things yeah. to be available, versus actually I'm getting very poor care under the current systems for those with established illness. Garth, what sort of safeguards do you have in the system to protect confidentiality where needs be, particularly in this more sensitive and complex area of mental health, for instance? So there's a couple of layers within the system. So you can actually put a restriction access code on your record, which means no one in the health ecosystem can have a look at your record unless you expressly give them that code. If it's um, you only want to restrict, say, mental health or sexual health or something, you can actually go through and put um, documents under restricted and you can then go to the different 
organisations that you work with and actually say, well, this one can look at my restricted documents because it's my mental health GP or specialist, but these ones cannot. So you can sort of set that granular filtering within the system. Um, you know, what we found is that, that people that are aware also may have a nominated or an authorised rep. So somebody who will often not be able to manage their own health care can actually have another party who can either activate, look at their record and actually make decisions in that record or just look at it as a read only. But it does give that option that if there is somebody who comes in who's incapacitated or is unable to communicate clearly that there is other channels to get in and validate that information and, and to perhaps review it. Um, you know, it'll be something that will continue to evolve, I think, mm. with what's going through legislation at the moment and the changes. We've got that balance on, you know, making sure the content is... Um, people are comfortable, that it's safe and secure, and they really have that option of, no. of getting rid of it or, no. or deleting it and so forth. Christine, what's your sense of the evolution, particularly of the confidentiality safeguards? Do you have a feeling that through your experience, things are evolving or likely to evolve? Well, I'm quite comfortable with the security on my, my health record. I can appreciate other people may not, but you, can, you do have power to uh, open it as much mm. as you want to do that. I guess my... And, and I appreciate it's in early days in one way and value the fact that we have it, but I would be looking to more interaction or interactive features in it as time goes by. Um, I've, I've been very fortunate because since 2010 I've had clinicians that allow me to talk to them by virtual means and so I kind of look for that now, you know. Oh, ah, really? That. Yeah, so um, the... But when also, you say by virtual, you mean well, by like, email or...? Yeah, so my first... My clinician at PA um, gave me her mobile number when I first came to her in 2010 and we used to do virtual consultations and SMS yes. and email and yes. all that. So it, it got me into that partnership mode, I guess, which I yes. really appreciated. Yes. And even now, with some clinicians, if I have email or something, it does give me an opportunity to say something if I really want. I, I, I'm careful about it, but yeah. I do have that partnership arrangement, so, so I can appreciate even more features of that. Um, so there's a few things that I would like to see. I, I would like to see... Um, obviously, being able to have an opinion about some of the things that go on. So as you see information floating through there, you know, one is uh, you could verify it, yes, which some consumers say it's wrong. That discharge thing doesn't have the right things. I should be able to say that. Um, if I see, you know, a decision has to be... I've made, had to make decisions in my health care that have been very difficult. And so being able to talk to someone or do something with that in some way to sort of help me... Mm perhaps educational resources. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Googler expert, but, uh, you know, you have to learn which are credible sites and which aren't credible sites, <laughs> what you can believe and what you can't. But I think it would be nice to have dedicated educational resources of some kind so it would help people build up their um, understanding don't of what they don't think we should be need. clear, they're not going to come through my health record. I mean, there are, there's an explosion worldwide in all of these assistive technologies. I mean... I would argue the role for the government is, is going back to the airline analogy is create great runways so that much better vehicles uh -huh. can arrive all around the world yeah. so you access information from all around the world. Well, I guess what I'm saying there is that you know that it's trustworthy whether yes. where it comes from, whether it's connected from somewhere else because that is a real challenge to know. You know, like just recently I've been reading about a certain thing and honestly a lot of it was not, not credible. But I, well, I had to work my way through all that information to learn what mm, is and what mm. isn't. So it's quite a journey for people to understand. So some way that they can have credible sources to know at least a starter of what they're trying to do. And the other one is, and it may go out from somewhere else, is um, it's a very lonely journey. I, I, I work in a very... <laughs> I'm a patient in a very big hospital system in all of those years, 16 years of being in and out of... I have not really talked to another patient about my own... Really? ..that sort of concerns. We just sit there in waiting rooms. And I think, obviously, the support groups, but <clears throat> being able to hear some of the stories of people and just what they approve and what's safe for them to say, but being able to read or to interact with other mm. consumers to say, this is my story, would be really supportive for people when they're tackling things and they feel quite alone in a big system. So I think there's lots of different ways that we could maybe enhance the system over time to help people become more empowered. How... But give me an example. How would you enhance it? 
What are these better well, I think health highways? Well, the, if you've got the highways in place, facilitating self-help groups, facilitating information, facilitating access to the world's best information in certain areas, mm. bringing that back to the particular mm. thing. So you're not... I mean, many great hospitals in Australia, but you might prefer to see what the Mayo Clinic's doing or John Hopkins yeah. is doing or how yeah. they manage that situation. Yeah. In fact, you may prefer to bring their system into your hospital, you know, yeah. in particular ways. You may prefer to join their patient group for that rare disease in a particular way. So I think the digital enablers are already growing very quickly. What they've not been able to connect to is our actual health system. Yeah. <laughs> so they exist in this isolation of the, the net as it generally exists. And very, people, most, many patients have become very active in those worlds but they can't connect it with their own personal experience. Mm, mm. So I think this is happening worldwide. The challenge for us is to have a national infrastructure that is actually enabling mm. and, and can allows that to in, come back to your hospital, your clinic, your providers, so that we're all sharing the same information and you'll be able to ask the doctor, why aren't we doing things the way they do it at the Mayo Clinic or John Hopkins or somewhere else? You know, and there may be very good reasons as to why we are yeah, or we aren't, yeah. or other people have had experiences, they benefited from this type of thing or not. I mean, your comment, I mean, uh, I think many people, many providers have been using obvious digital technologies to, in, to increase the efficiency and the responsiveness of people they take care of with chronic diseases. It's much easier for me, I prescribe a medication yesterday for a patient to tell me they had a side effect today, then not know and wait four weeks and find they never yeah, took the yeah. drug because they had a problem on day two which is the current kind of system right. in a non-digital world. But, in, but the trouble is Medicare and the fee-for-service system... Mm -hmm. Which are dumb. Designed, which are dumb. <laughs> but they're not designed to pay the doctor to give time to right. re respond to emails. That's so the national infrastructure includes the national broadband network, it includes the national yeah. financing systems. This isn't just a tech issue. But isn't no. this a problem? Though? I mean, increasingly, yeah. people, you're fortunate you can uh, you know, communicate with your doctor outside the surgery. This ain't that common yet because doctors will resist it if they're not being paid for it. Well, as far as I understand, doctors have been saying that message for quite a long yeah. time. But hang on, hang on. We do stuff every day we don't but get they, paid that's right. for. I mean, that's not real. I mean, I really resent that kind of argument. I mean, doctors do all sorts of things, I think, in partnership with mm. people they care for every day to try and make better care. And since we had these things, Lots of doctors, lots of doctors I know, do use digital technology every day. Sure. Now, there may be restrictions. In fact, it's the other way around. Some public authorities, some hospitals, some others prevent their doctors using technology. That's right. even more interesting. So it's not the doctor didn't get paid for it. The organisation you work for says you're not to do it. I suppose <laughs> I'm thinking more of the, the GPs, many of whom yeah. are d relying yeah. on a bulk billing income, needing yeah. volume of patient... Yeah. Yep. Services, you know, I it agree. is difficult I think for them. It should be addressed. It's been around, that issue has <coughs> been around for quite a long time, and it's sh it's probably one of those institutional type things that do, does need yeah. to be addressed. That would encourage more people to feel free to do that. But you're right. A lot of people that I know do use it. I mean, clinicians give their time very freely to to of patients course they do. in so lots we've got, of ways. We've got MBS reform committees going it's somewhere in the country. I mean, we need the payment systems to line up with the healthcare delivery systems of the 21st century. Mm. Um, Garth, to what extent is My Health Record and the Digital Health Agency able to or exposed to overseas international developments that may provide advances for what can be offered here? Well, we actually have a global, global digital health partnership that was created um, last year, which actually has about 17 member countries, oh, really? including Canada, US, Israel, Singapore and so forth. And, um, that's actually been quite good because we've actually been able to have some policy discussions at what would be considered a global level yeah. around how some of those things would work. Now, as, as Ian's pointed out, um, the conversation though then is obviously if you're talking things around claim and payments or whether you pay MBS based on an outcome versus based on a service, a lot of those will actually be more a health department type thing. Mm -hmm. So while we'll be involved in the conversation, it really comes down to a probably a, a government policy on how they want to do that. But I think the discussion will become more informed with this sort of global partnership and, and the people raising the issues that I really want mm. an outcome rather than a, a bunch of uh, service events. Yeah. Um, in, in the mental health sphere, there's a growing number of sort of online apps uh, helping people uh, with their condition. Um, are there concerns that this is loading too much onto the patient? And is this a wider concern with digital health? that it can mean people, sure, can access more information, but at the same time, perhaps, don't get to consult or see the, the doctor or whatever when they should. Well, we're one of those areas of healthcare 
where demand far exceeds supply. So actually, we're going to have something different happen. We're going to have the uberisation of mental health. We have so failed to develop a health system to respond to the actual community demand mm. that private providers and digital health options, the apps you've talked about, are already out there. If you sit in the US, you can watch television ads telling you to go see a psychologist online, and people are mm. because it's affordable and it's accessible and they're not getting it under current arrangements. But Here does it work? Yes, it works a little bit short term. So most of the digital health I'm interested in is not an alternative to the rest of the health systems, but we have a major problem that the health systems have been so slow to develop quality mental health care that other options digitally base, and they won't just be based in a sense, you can now access overseas. Mm. Very close colleague and friend of mine, previous commissioner Jackie Crow, sadly died last year. She was accessing great health care from the UK online okay. for her mental health condition, which she was paying for, because it was so much better and responsive. Medication changes respond overnight. Mm. Things mm. happened overnight. Clinician interaction based in the UK. So this issue of where is best care, now, it's not the goal of mental health apps or digital health to replace or simply compete with, but we've got a real problem in the extent to which our mm. traditional health care system is responding to the volume. So. I am quite sceptical about apps on their own and systems on their own, but they're filling a void at the moment yeah. that is not being met by traditional health care. So the ideal mental health care integrates both. What about this? This raised safety and quality in health care issues at all. Christine, you're uh, with the uh, part of the uh, health, sa Quality and Safety mm. Commission's uh, uh, work in this area. Does the digital health raise new, fresh, different challenges in terms of safety and quality? Um, I think actually there's a lot more benefits than challenges. I think that there's more accuracy in the data if it's digital and the quality of healthcare, depending on what level you're thinking of. I mean, you know, I think consumers sure have their own needs from the digital health system, but they need to think widely that it's not just about us and our own care, it's also about uh, better improved care for cohorts of people. For example, in Queensland hospitals, they have the diabetes um, dashboards and things like that that yep. can look at whole cohorts. Or it could be around research and around healthcare systems generally that I would expect that we would have, because of the increased data and the richer data that they can get, that consumers generally will be better off because they can then make informed decisions on empirical data. Um, on the other hand, if you're the consumer and you are expected to make some more decisions perhaps around where we're being pushed to say, how much do you want to be involved in your health care? Mm. And I think that's something that we have to feel comfortable about. Um, I have at times felt overwhelmed by data and stopped looking at things uh, because it was actually complicating it. So I make choices not to, and perhaps I talk to a clinician then if I'm confused. Um, I think it's around trust, really. I think the clinicians and the patients, they have to trust each other and they have to work at that so that they can make judgment calls and accept each other's opinion. Um, so if I raced off and wanted to look at an app, um, then I would may if, you know, I would have to be informed and think, is this gonna really help? And then mm. maybe I would talk to somebody. So I think we are asking a lot more of consumers in what their digital literacy, in their health literacy, um, but obviously it still comes down to the fact that you have people that are in your care, that are looking after your care as well, and so therefore there's communication with them mm. as well, which, you know, you have to be quite skilled sometimes to actually yep. navigate your way around, and sometimes you feel like your own case manager, which is can be challenging. I accept that, you know, so I think we need to be have self-efficacy when we can, and when we can't, we need to be free to ask that this isn't working. So. That's a protection, yeah. yes. Garth, do you think there's a question of balance here, I think, between the extent to which my health record and digital health is there to help clinicians consult other clinicians or to help patients with their clinicians? Is there a sort of a, a challenge here in terms of getting the balance right or is it you play it, you know, one case at a time or what? Um, look, I think in terms of the my health record, there, there probably is a balance and I think 
Um, putting the citizen at, at the core of their own record is really important and having the ability to control it, as we've talked about today, is important. But I think some of what we're talking about here, if we put the My Health record aside, if you look at the generation coming through, everything they do is online. Mm. They don't go to shops anymore. They order online. They buy food online. It's delivered to the house. It's very much a self-service, I want it now type mentality. Mm. So irrespective of My Health record, there will be a shift for, you know, I've got a 12 and a 14 year old, you know, 14 year old daughter, so you can imagine all sorts of fun and things coming through her life and every time I build a system I think, oh my God, you know, she's <laughs> got to be in that, you know, as a dad, how do I make sure it's safe and protected? But if I look at online in general, the same thing, she's interacting and she's going to expect by the time she's 25 that she might be able to see a doctor online yes, through a webcam. Yes without having to go there because, Guess you know, what? I'm sick. They what? want a more responsive health system. <laughs> Guess but, what? But this... They want the responsiveness and, uh, to their needs. So, so this is a big challenge to the more paternalistic But the uberisation of yes. health, I mean, this instant uh, drive-through health care or whatever it is going to be, is that really in our interest? Fundamentally, there are two issues here, and I think Christine has raised the important ones. I actually think the accountability of systems improves considerably. We learn what is not right in the current systems. And we've just this week seen reports about accidents and injuries in the health system. Yes, they're enormous. People don't realise in the current system the risks they're actually taking. But if we're moving it faster, so doesn't one, the risk well, increase? Well, we've been slow. I mean, health has been a terrible industry from an information technology point of view to respond to the digital age. Mm. Only health could have survived this long without doing this, because <laughs> people are so trusting of the health system and doctors mm -hmm. and hospitals. Yeah. They've got no idea of the risks they're currently at. They've got some idea of the inconvenience of waiting and waiting lists and can't. So the expectation you'd be more responsive, and I think we see this also with the National Disability Insurance Scheme, a shift to, mm -hmm. hang on, I have complex needs, not simple needs. I really don't like the primary care idea of everything's simple. Mm. Most things are complicated and we're going to get more personalised. And, and the future of healthcare is to be more personalised so your needs go in and you get the right response the first time and the level of need gets responded to. So what we should end up with is smarter systems that more efficiently triage what you get to get the right level sooner, not to have to go through a whole lot of steps right. where you fail and queue up and waste my time and money till you finally see someone that's right for your problem. So I think, you know, the modern young consumer, hopefully that'll be all of us as it is in many of the other things we now do digitally. So it's a big challenge to the existing system, you bet. Um, this triaging system, I mean, is... Do you think my health record is really moving towards that sort of triaging, if you like, the virtual triaging, so that a patient's <coughs> going to more likely get the coordinated care because of my health record? Is that your sense of it? I think... If you uh, just let it sit there, that's maybe the case, but probably not. <laughs> um, I think, it, it, as I was saying before, it does require consumers to take a role. And they may be very happy about doing that, but um, you, you do have to drive that. Mm. You do have to have some part in that. So um, otherwise, I think it would just sit there and just be the repository type idea. Sure. But do you think, Christine, some kind of consumers in our area, this is happening in mental health and in other chronic diseases, a certain kind of consumer will drive the system faster? Because yes. they're the ones who get us. You don't have to have everyone to understand <coughs> it, whatever. But when, oh, totally. when certain kinds of problems are pressing the system to respond faster and smarter, that'll actually drive a good deal of the improvement, which the rest yes. of us lazy you just will be the beneficiaries of. Yes, so track. I, I think there is a shift to having more consumer voice. Yeah. Uh, how much that actually drives, you know, the complete institutional systems, I'm not <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. I guess it's variant. We had, a, we, we had a question, how will the quality of inputs be ensured? My w wife went from the emergency department to intensive care unit to a cardiac ward, then to a general ward. When she left the hospital, her discharge report was full of inconsistent statements mm -hmm. about medication and confusing information about what had happened and what it was thought had happened. I mean, isn't this the problem? We get information overload as a result of my health record. Can I ask Garth, you're the, you're the data manager, what, how do you deal with this? Look, look, from that sort of point of view, um, it's actually quite beneficial because what, what normally would occur is you would get a paper-based letter, a discharge summary that arrived 10 days after you left the hospital to your practitioner, right? In this case, it's uploaded, general, if they're connected, straight away. Now, 
as a consumer, I would go in and look at that, and then I would immediately go back to the hospital and say, look, I believe this or this didn't occur, and you can get it updated or amended. That opportunity didn't exist on a completely paper-based mm. process. You know, I don't think people would sort of wait two or three weeks, go back to their doctor and then go, I think that's wrong, and then I'm not sure how that would, you know, feed back. Whereas if you've got that opportunity to do that sort of, you know, the 48 hours after you've left and you've got that relevant information, it gives you that opportunity to go back. And that will just improve the quality, which means two years down the track when somebody's referring to those documents, they're actually going to make a more informed decision. You know, it might be as simple as, well, it was a left knee, right knee that I grazed or cut or whatever, but... You know, it's relevant in the bigger picture, and I think having the citizen a access to that quickly just... Well, quite often quality. people will have complex conditions which are involving complex and uh, sophisticated treatment. They won't understand the, the chemistry or whatever is involved when they look at what's happened to them at hospital, will they? Oh, I think consumers have a pretty good idea. Do they? Yes. <laughs> but if I was being treated for some complication of diabetes and high blood pressure and the different medications had been used, I wouldn't know, would I? I think if you have a complex condition, you start learning about that. You yeah. would maybe even sense there's something wrong, whether you understand completely what every medication does. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But I have, you know, I've heard these stories before around discharge summaries and I... I think you're pretty vigilant at that point, or someone in your family is your carer to know there is something wrong with that. I mean, example given is fabulous. The current record is incredibly inaccurate. Wrong things are written down all the time. Here's a chance to correct, and often That's I think right. it's often the person themselves or a carer goes, hang on, that didn't happen, or that stopped because of the side effect, which is not in the traditional summary. So actually mm. this transparency of records corrects problems, but also allows an interaction. It, it highlights at the moment that we get inaccurate information all the time. A discharge summary I get from a hospital doesn't tell me about the four other things that were tried that caused problems but was chosen not to put in the discharge yeah. summary. I can't see. That's and the patient themselves doesn't know necessarily those things. So the increased transparency where someone who cares, guess who cares? The patient themselves and the family. Right. They really care to get it right. Because, you know, it is a certain kind of consumer. It won't be everyone but it drives quality improvement in the system. Even within hospitals at the moment, the transfer information from one department to another mm. contains mm. these kind of inaccuracies. But we in the healthcare system, just we, yeah, we just sort of let it go. You know, someone who cares suddenly starts to interact with that. And I think people's expectations at the moment for my health record, it isn't doing all this at the moment. There's a whole lot of levels of developments of the system. But once you've got a system that actually can allow that to develop, we're in a whole other world. OK, are there things we need to watch, then? I mean, it, the way Ian paints it, it looks as though we're on the verge of a wonderful new era of perfect health care. <laughs> are there things that you think we need to watch as this rolls out, Christine? Well, in summary, I think people need to be feel comfortable about the privacy of their information, which I know is already having some work done on that, because that's been a concern for quite a long time. And I think the other one is probably to feel confident that they can use that system and know how to use it. So some sort of education to help people understand digital and what that means for health and then what they can do with it. I think there's still some work there that mm. to make sure we give each consumer an understanding of perhaps what they want to do with it. OK. Garth, is there any final points you'd like to make about what's about to wrap up? pretty much on the same vein as what Christine's saying. It's really, as things evolve, we just need to look at what the outcomes that people are looking for and how do we safe and securely deliver those outcomes so we can keep confidence in the system and, and keep people trusting it. It, it. It's great to share information, but it needs to be done in a way that is secure and, um, and, therefore, and, and as accurate as possible and having these abilities for people to, you know, interact with it as the owner of their own data. Cyber security really matters and it will be challenging. It's challenging in every other industry and it will be challenging here. So that's got to be at the top. But beyond that, I want a country that actually has the capacity to import the world's best technology here so Australians can use the world's best evolving technology in personal health care as soon as possible and link the consumer real active bit with sensible, smart, actual available information. Thanks. Any last word from you, Christy? Um, no, I, I guess my last word would be to each consumer that you need to feel comfortable with your decision about how you use my health record and to think about broadly about what it could do for you before you may quickly feel anxious to opt out. I think 
Uh, and if you need to explore new information, then go ahead and try and find out what are the benefits. And I mean, there's more webinars to come that will also talk about those issues, so to be informed. Thank you, Christine, Garth and Ian. As Christine says, there's more formal webinars to come. Thank you for your uh, participation today and look forward to having you back for the next four series. Thank you.